Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Rakafek Rusik Amanak, a true trailblazer in digital banking innovation. Rakafek led the transformation of Bank Lumi into Israel's most profitable and forward-thinking bank before becoming a managing partner at Team 8, a fintech foundry. We explore her transition from traditional bank to Team 8 and delve in the unique foundry model that drives its mission of innovation and growth. Throughout the conversation, Rakefik sheds light on the strategies that enable fintech firms to navigate the changing funding dynamics and the balance between innovation and stability. Her insights offer a profound perspective on the intersection of established banking wisdom and the nimbleness of startups. Additionally, Rakefik's dedication to diversity and empowerment takes center stage as we discuss her contributions to fostering a more inclusive fintech industry. So welcome to the show, Rakefik. You know, the last time we saw each other, we were at Money 2020 in Amsterdam, and you were on stage with uh, several other women talking about startups and the, the power, the advantages, the disadvantages, the challenges of women in finance. And you really have quite a history where you were at not only the biggest and most successful bank in Israel, but then you made the transformation to being at uh, the organization you are now. So can you share a little bit about yourself and your firm? Okay, a little bit about, about myself. So let's start. I started as an accountant. Oh, wow. I was an accountant for nine years. I was a partner in KPMG in Israel. And then I was the CEO of the firm. But the truth is that I, I never liked accounting. So at a certain point, I was looking for something which will make me happier. And I thought that banking is the thing. And credit was my passion. And I moved to Bank Lumi, became, uh, after a very short period, the chief credit officer of the bank. But unfortunately, I joined in 2004. In 2008, when I was chief credit officer of the, of the group, the credit crunch hit. So yeah. I was, actually, it was very interesting and challenging, but not very easy. In 2012, I, I joined, uh, I started my tenure as the CEO of the bank and things changed dramatically because the situation of the bank was challenging. Revenues were very nice, but stable for many, many years and expenses were going up because of regulation and IT. And I was looking for a solution to a very um, challenging situation. And this is where I discovered the magic of technology. And actually, this was a turning point for me because suddenly I realized that with technology, you can do everything. So we started a very aggressive digital transformation. Some will say digital turnaround, I don't know. But it was from, or we started when I, 2012 with um, 14,000 people. When I ended, we were 9,000 people. Oh, wow. We, we started with 300 <clears throat> brick and mortar branches. When I ended, we had 200. We had lots of subsidiaries that we merged into the bank, so no subsidiaries, much less divisions. So a very aggressive um, transformation that, ch that changed the whole thing. And Lumi, slowly but surely became, at the end, the largest company, company, not a bank, company in Israel, market cap wise. Oh, wow. Okay. So this, this was like the process, how I fell in love with technology. Parallel to this, I realized that when you um, take a very old incumbent like Lumi, and I don't know if you know that, but Lumi, mm -hmm celebrated last year, 120 years. Yep. Lumi was born in London in 1902 as part of Herzl's vision uh, to be the, the bank for the Jewish diaspora. And 
And then it became Lumi in Israel. So Lumi, when I started to run it, in, it was 110. The wow. state of Israel was 65. <laughs> and the infrastructure was very convoluted in any way you can think about it. So everything we did digitally was actually a digital skin on a non-digital body. And that's why I didn't think it's enough. So while transforming the existing uh, activity of the bank, we decided to build, in addition, from scratch, a neobank. Back then, Pepper. Yeah. Back then, we didn't even know the word neobank. I don't think the word, the term neobank was was really a thing. But we knew that we wanted something which will be a startup within an incumbent that will be digital native, unlike the bank. There is a digital skin on a non-digital body. This will be digital native, all digital. And then we can make it really personalized, really um, um, relevant for millennials. So this is, this is in a nutshell, the story uh, of my tenure in Lumi. But then 2019, the bank reached a peak of market share back then. And that was very profitable and was very innovative. And I felt that this is, this is a, the, the time to step down and to pursue my passion for technology. Or I can say it differently. I can say that I decided to turn around my own career, just like I did to the bank. Yeah. Because I didn't have any technology background. Actually, I should say differently. I don't have any technology background. <laughs> I never did because I, I never studied anything in technology. Mm -hmm. I had lots of years in university, accounting, economics. I did my MBA and then I went to law school, 10 years of academia when I studied. And, and I was also a teacher, a professor in, in, in the university. But nothing close to te technology, not computer science, no engineering, nothing. And I was very... Um, concerned that this part is missing. And I, I had connections with a friend. Um, he is my, my dear partner today. His name is Nadav Tzafrir. I met him um, in 2014 while I had a cyber, cyber event in the bank, a ransom event. I was introduced to Nadav by my husband. They knew from the army Nadav was the, the commander, the former commander of 8200, and he left the army in 2013 and decided to build a foundry in cyber. So you'd ask, what is foundry? So foundry is where you raise money from investors, but not in order to invest in other people's companies, but in order to build, to invest and build companies with entrepreneurs like co-found the companies with them. So this was mm -hmm. his idea, a very different idea. And he started to do it in cyber and then we met. And I called him and I said, okay, I'm the CEO of Bank Lumi and I am in deep trouble. So can you, can you help? And they were amazing. They came to look to the bank. They, with all these genius people that he brought with him, the tech people. And after maybe 48 hours within all this very bad event of 16 days, they found where it leaked from, that it was not from the bank, but it was from the credit card company. So they were very helpful and very nice. And what happened after that? For them, it was an amazing opportunity because they are so smart. So they, they left the bank and they said, so what happened here? We, the cafe called us. And we, we helped her and it was an incident response story. So let's build an incident response company. And they decided to build this company called the company Signia and uh, invested a few millions. And after three and a half years, if I recall, they sold it to Temasek for $250 million. So this was wow. the story for them. Wow. For me, Nadav and myself, we, we stayed very good friends. And then he introduced me to his first 
and most important investor. His name is he's also a very uh, dear partner of ours today. His name is Yuval Shachar. He was um, a partner in innovation endeavors with Eric Schmidt. And the three of us became friends. And when I decided to step down, so Nadav was, was, was talking to, be, to me and said, what are you going to do? And I said, what do you mean? Fintech. I, I, I'm in love with technology and I don't understand cyber, of course, but I would do fintech. And then we discussed it and discussed this. And the idea was, why don't we take what they did in cyber and just copy paste it to fintech? So I stepped down from the bank. It was the end of 2019 and it was just before COVID. Every, everybody thinks I, I was just preparing myself to live before COVID, but <laughs> as you understand, it's not really the case. Anyway, I left and I, I joined them, um, raised money from amazing investors, mainly in the US, Europe, and a bit in Singapore, and brought amazing partners. I have um, Ronen Asia, who is the co-founder of eToro, that joined us for the FinTech and Galia Bergabel from PayPal and some others. And we have today a team of dozens of people in FinTech. And it, we are now building the fourth company and we are investing maybe in the sixth. So we have around 10 companies in FinTech in the group. And the group is, is, is becoming bigger and bigger every, every year. I can tell you that at the beginning of last year in 22, we said, well, if we can copy paste it to FinTech, we can do it to digital health as well. And there are so many intersections in between digital health and FinTech, right. digital health and cyber and cyber and FinTech. So it gets, it brings a lot of opportunities. So today, if I have to describe what, what we are, so we are very unique venture group that um, is specialized in enterprise tech, mainly cyber, fintech, and digital health. And we have two asset classes. We have the company building, which is the main infrastructure of everything mm -hmm. we do. But we invest, we have also a regular VC, and we invest in companies in each and every domain that we have expertise in. So this is this is in a nutshell. My story, teammate story, I don't know. I will pose here. Well, it, what's interesting because it's all logical. I mean, it's interesting because you started in the finance area of Lumi and 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 you moved up, but it's because of your love for tech. And then you built Pepper, which was at the time, you know, the most innovative and the first digital bank in Israel, but also an extraordinarily important endeavor because it really was, as you said, you built something outside of a core that was so very old and antiquated but it served its customers very well. So you, you both had the legacy bank and the neo bank, and then your transition, your love for tech actually basically pushed you into what you're doing today and something that you love. And, and, you know, it's interesting because it's, as you mentioned, teammate is really very different than a traditional um, FinTech uh, startup uh, VC company. You, you, it's a foundry model, as you mentioned. So how does a foundry model differentiate itself in the fintech space? So when you're meeting with a, a fintech startup, you know, you're building from scratch as opposed to buying into something that's already started. How, how does that really differ from the perspective of what you see in the marketplace? Okay, it's, it's very easy for me to, to compare and explain the differences because actually we have both foundry and fund. Okay. So in, in our regular fund, what we do, we meet just like any other fund. We meet entrepreneurs that have idea and, and sometimes they already raise money. Sometimes they didn't, but they have an idea. They, they come with their deck. They bring all the, the, the story they want to tell. And sometimes they already have some validation. In a, in a certain point along their journey, they come to you and you decide if you want to invest in them. This is a regular fund and the way we also work. We have the foundry model, 
which is very different because within the foundry, we don't wait for entrepreneurs to bring ideas. And it doesn't mean that we don't have many entrepreneurs that come and say, we have a great idea, let's build a company together within the foundry. But to begin with, some of our companies were built out of the ideas of the foundry. So we have a team that research and gets into fintech trends and problems and, and looking for some huge issues to solve. And when we find a big problem, a big challenge that we have passion to, because the passion is the most important thing. Right, yep. Sometimes we have, there is, a, there is an idea that comes up, but we look at each other and we say, who, is going to, who wants to deal with it on a daily basis? And there is, a, and, and it's very quiet in the room because no one wants. And then, and then I say, well, so we are not going to build it because it doesn't make sense. The only way you can make it and succeed, and I don't, I don't need teammate for this. I know it from Lumi, I know it from KPMG. We both know it. If you don't have passion for something, just don't do that. So we, we ideate, we find ideas that we like, or I mean, challenges and problems that we like the space, where we like the space. Then we start validating it. Parallel to ideating, we are on a constant search for founders because there is no way, as I said, you need the passion, yes, but there is no way you can build a company without entrepreneurs that get up every morning and, and will do everything in order to, do, to build this company. So we need the two. Sometimes the idea comes before the, the, the founders. Sometimes the founders are there and we are looking for idea together. Sometimes we have, and we had a case like this a year ago, we met founders, we really like them. They came with, a, with a, an idea around credit. As I told you, I, I have um, history, a, lot, a lot of background yep. in credit, and I didn't like the idea. However, we told them either, let's, let's work on it together. Either you convince us that this is an amazing idea, and then we will build it together, or you will change your mind and, and we will show you that it's not. Anyway, they, they decided, to, to drop it. They didn't want it at the end. And they took one of our ideas from our ideation process. So in a nutshell, the foundry is where we are much more involved. We are really, as a, as a co-founder, at the end of the day, the company belongs to the entrepreneurs. There is no way to build a startup uh, without this perception because for example, if they get an acquisition offer and they want to sell, it's done. It will be sold, even if we don't want to sell. Because if they don't want to get up in the morning and continue building it, so it it's done. It doesn't make any sense, yeah. So the company is theirs, but unlike a regular investor that is only bringing them, it's not only because most investors help as much as they can, but unlike regular investor that does it, um, but not as part of his job, we are there. They sit with us. We have a building in Tel Aviv. We have a, 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 a floor in New York. We are with them on a daily basis. We, our platform, not just for FinTech, but for everything we do is almost 100 people. We have tech research. We have business research. We have biz dev, finance, HR. We have everything. So they come to us and we are like, um, give them the whole thing, like it's an umbrella that provides them a very good start. And take into account that within Teammate, we have partners and people from different perspectives, with different backgrounds, with different um, network, and they can have all of it. If someone is building a cyber company, okay, not in FinTech, and he needs a connection to a certain bank because they want to sell them the cyber services, I'll do my best to, 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 to connect. So this is a very um, diverse group with a lot of opportunities to, to get help. So when you look at founders and um, you mentioned the, the need for passion, 
but they've also have to have passion for what your idea is. You know, one of the things that you talked about at Money 20 and one of the things that is really key to who you are, because you are a female, is the <laughs> real gender inequity in the founder space, in the investor space, and in the finance space. Now, you you battled some of those battles in a very, very traditional traditional bank environment, which which by itself is a challenge in, in any industry where you have a woman who's the leader in the organization. But, you know, as you got into the fintech space and the founder space and the VC space, it's even a bigger issue because when we look at the numbers, they tell a story that there aren't enough female founders, female leaders in the innovation in the startup space. Number one, what do you think causes that? And number two, how do we solve for that? First of all, I would just say that I don't think it's more an issue today than it was in banking. It's, it was all the time the same. I can share with you that when I was the CEO of Lumi, I was part of an amazing group of CEOs. It calls I, IMC, International Monetary Conference, that meet once a year with the CEOs of the largest and most significant banks in the world. We were a group of 62, if I recall the number, but maybe I'm not accurate, but you know what I, I know for sure? There were only two women there, Anna Boutin from Santander and Rakefet from Israel. That's all. At a certain point at the beginning, I think there was one CEO from India, which was a woman, but then she was, she was replaced and, and that's it. So it, it was, it was unbelievably, um, it was very extreme, even in banking. Now, if I talk about, we have in, a, a teammate around 30 companies, half of them are companies that were built in the foundry and half of them companies that we invested in. And I can, I can say that we don't have female founders, probably at all, which is, which is unbelievable. So yeah. first of all, it's, this is w where you reach the top, maybe it's CEOs of banks, entrepreneurs that build companies from scratch. You rarely see women. And then the question is why? And the question is how, how do we fix it? I can tell you, first of all, that with, with the entrepreneurs, it's easier for me to understand the phenomena because being a, an entrepreneur usually um, ha happens to you or you, choose, you, you start a company usually when you are young. Most of our entrepreneurs are at the age of 30 some, 30 to 40. This is the toughest time for a woman, because if you want to have a family, this is when you have babies. Yeah. Sometimes they don't sleep at night. So being an entrepreneur, which is one of the toughest thing, because like once in, in a few days, sometimes even more, you, you hit the wall because yeah. that's, that's building a startup. Now think about hitting the wall when you have few babies and some of them don't sleep at night and one is sick. Very difficult. So it's not really surprising that we don't have many female entrepreneurs because it's difficult and at the end of the day, even though um, it's not the same in between men and women today, life, life and wife and husband, you can see that the sharing is, is, is much better. At the end, the mother is a mother. So this is about entrepreneurs. About CEOs, it's more surprising because when kids grow up and, and you, you, know, you know, you look at the CEOs of banks in the world, I would say that probably the age was close to 60 average. A woman could do that just like a man. So I don't know. Yeah, so, you know, as, as you're looking at, founders for new companies. 
Do you do you put in, do you personally try to put extra emphasis on trying to find females, or is that one of those things that, as you said, it, it's a challenge to begin with because you know if you're looking for somebody in their thirties, they have other responsibilities as well. How do you help to foster diversity and try to empower not just women but other minorities within the fintech space? How do you think we have to do that as a community? First of all. Um, I'll tell you that I like working with women. Uh, at Lumi, uh, top management, management was 14 people and 40%, four zero, was women. Meaning, and, and I'm telling you that I never chose someone because she was a, a female, never. Just because I thought she's better. So there are great women and they, and I think that a room with men and women together is a better room because it's more diverse. And uh, probably I could say it about other minorities as well, as, as you, when you get a room which is diverse, it's much, much better. You get a better result. So yep. first of all, yes, I think we should make it happen. I can tell you that personally, I, um, I'm part, very uh, integral part of a program amazing program that uh, Meta, Facebook, um, started in Israel maybe five or six years ago. The name of the, of the program is She, She. She uh, established women with She, young women. Uh, pro- usually it's women like me with younger one, 35, 30, with the one in between 35 to 40. And this is an amazing program that they uh, choose, I don't think it's 40 or 50 a year now. And we have a mentorship relationship along a full year. And when they started it five years ago, probably they chose those mentees and we worked with them. But today, in order to, cho- to choose this 40, 50, they have 1,000 or 2,000 candidates. It just shows you how much it's needed, how much mentorship women need in order to find their way around. So I do whatever I can in mentorship, in, in, in letting women be part of, my, of, of the workspace of teammates and before it knew me, but this is a challenge. It's, it's not going to be solved with this small project. I, I'm aware yeah. of this. Okay, fact, as we look at fintech companies today. You know, it, it's an interesting time. It's hard to get funding. There's a lot of investors that are more tentative than they used to be. But as you're building fintech companies, how do you strike the balance between innovation and stability? Because more than ever, I think we can both assure ourselves that that today, these startups really have to be good business models first and foremost because getting funding is more difficult than ever. So how do you how do you ensure that the companies that you're starting up not only have the innovative spirit, but the ability to act like a business as opposed to simply looking for more funds? First of all, you are very right that these days um, mm-hmm. startups um, are being tested not just by volumes and innovation, also, and much more, by unit economics, because this is a different period. So I agree. When we start a company, we look for an amazing, innovative product. However, we ask ourselves if there is a product market fit, meaning that this product can be part of the the financial ecosystem. And maybe I will elaborate a bit, how do we see the financial ecosystem? And within it, what companies do we build in order to fit in? So when you look at the the financial playground, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we had one group of, of players. This was what we call today the incumbents, the banks, the insurance companies, all those. So this today, there are only one group. There are three groups today. 
on this playground. So this is the incumbents, which is one group. And then there are the fintechs, second group. And there is a third group that we shouldn't ignore, which is the non-financial players. Yep. Now let's analyze it. The incumbents, they have an amazing asset. And this asset is the customer, customer base. And they have to innovate. Innovating from within is very difficult. And I can talk about it for hours because this is exactly what I did for seven and a half years. And believe me, it wasn't easy. No. I can even tell you that when I was not in the room, they were like saying, ah, let's talk about Pepper, Rakefet's toy. Rakefet's toy, okay? The CEO's yeah. toy. So innovating from within brings a lot of issues of internal resistance. It's very difficult. Back then, when I started the transformation and Pepper, FinTech was much less developed than today. Right. Today, there are many companies, fintech companies, that can be embedded within the activity of the incumbents. So if you want to be transformative, if you want to be innovative and to take your bank forward, to make it much more efficient, to make it much more, um, to make your service much more innovative and, and smart and user experience much, much better, you have so many fintechs you can work with. Now, to your question, we are trying to build those fintechs that will accelerate digital transformation of, of incumbents, that will accelerate the, improve, the, the desire of incumbents to improve their customer experience. So, so this is the relationship. Now I would add the third uh, group, which is the non-financial ones. It became very relevant because many companies who are not part of the financial world, like Shopify, like Apple, like many others that mm -hmm. we can mention, the, the thing that they have, they have a huge customer base. Now, what they do in the last few years or starting to do, they embed fintech within. They say, well, we have lots of customers. Let's give them money, let's give them payment services, let's give them loan. So if you look at Shopify, for example, you will see that a very major part of their business, profits, revenues, is from fintech services. Right. What do they do with this? Actually, what they do is increasing revenues and increasing stickiness at the same time. So embed fintech within became an amazing trend. And here again, we at Teammate trying to build companies that can embed fintech within. Give you an example. We have a company called 40Cs. This is a company that accelerate, gives you credit in the trade finance corridor, US, China, yep. UK, um, India, whatever. Now we work with, as a design partner and investor, and credit uh, facility provider with Zim, which is, which is one of the largest carriers in the world. So suddenly they are in FinTech. What do they do? They embed FinTech within, they have this the shipment and they actually sell to their customers 40 Cs. So they get some revenue, participation in revenues with us. They get more stickiness because suddenly the customer can get credit within yep. their platform. Yep. So this whole mixture is a totally different story. Nothing like. And if you ask me, what do I think will be the next thing in FinTech? I would say 100% embedded FinTech. And I will tell you why I'm so sure about that. If you look in the last few years at nail banks, like Pepper and others in the US, Chime, Varro, Monzo in Europe, in England, whatever, we can name them, yep. many amazing, amazing uh, startups that were built. You can, you, and you see they got to fantastic valuations. Having said that, their customer acquisition cost is, is enormous. 
And it's very difficult to build a, um, a, a business case for this customer acquisition cost. So what do they do now? They bring fintech solution and they embed fintech solutions within. Now, what we are saying today, why should we build co companies, fintechs, for the end customer? It's very costly because in financial services, the cost of migrating a customer is huge. Is huge. Right. Instead of building fintechs, which are B2C, like we did, like I did in, in Pe with Pepper and, and others as well, yep. instead of building these B2C companies, Let's build B2B2C companies. Let's embed the fintech where the customer is instead of trying to bring the customer to the fintech. So here is what I'm saying, because maybe it was not clear enough. No, it, it's clear, yes. Okay, instead of moving the customer, yep. migrating the customer to the fintech service, let's migrate the fintech service where the customers are. So if I look at the future of financial services, what I see is a vision of hubs of customers, either incumbents that come from financial services originally, like, okay, JP Morgan Chase or Citi or I don't know whom, but on the side, Apple or Amazon or Walmart or Shopify or all others, hubs of customers who embed fintechs within. And because this is the future, in my opinion, what we do is we build companies that can be embedded within those hubs. This is what we do. So, so that being said, are you looking for new skill sets among your fintech founders, your fintech leaders that you're building that not only had the innovative spirit, the the ability to really think beyond what's there today, but they also have to have strong business skills because they're going to have to collaborate with either a traditional financial company or, as you mentioned, with an embedded non-financial company. But to do so, that takes different skill sets than it does to to build a brand new company. Does this look for, is this a completely different leader that you're looking at now with new build skill sets that include accounting, finance, um, interactive skills, as well as those disruptive, innovative skills that you're looking for in the past in FinTechs? So the answer is absolutely yes. What we need in order to, unlike when you build an enterprise tech company, a cyber company, and you need a lot of um, tech skills, which will be amazing. Here, you need the tech skills as well, but you also need the fintech skills, the business. It's not even fintech, it's business skills. Yeah. I'll give you an example of a company that we built for the US. The company is called April. April is a company that actually prepare for you as the end customer, your uh, tax, fi tax filing, tax report. That's why we call it April, because April 15 is the end of the tax season. Yep. As I told you, we don't sell B2C. We don't come and, and, and put signs in the advertisements in the streets sell, selling April. We sell April via partners. Yep. So we sell via April via Chime, or via VARA, via banks that offer their customers the, the, the app. This is an unbelievably technology smart company. It's built on Gen AI. And it started with this two and a half years ago. Yeah. And the CTO of the company in Israel is the, was the CTO of Waze. However, the CEO of the company, he lives in New York. He comes from fintech background and he was part of Deloitte before, yeah. and he was working with, with, with teammate before. So what do you have here? You have a tech minded, smartest person in the world that, that invented, that was part of Waze or was CTO of Waze. And now he can invent a Gen AI solution yeah. uh, in technology, but side by side, we have a CEO 
who is a business person that understands how you can sell yep. um, products to, to <clears throat> companies. Totally different. And you need the mixture because without, yeah. without the mixture, you will not make it. So finally, as you reflect upon your career, and your growth and and what you've gone through through the years and you know from what you've talked about the the building of pepper would not built like pepper would be built today if you had to build it again because of the whole need to to build an embedded solution even within the traditional financial company what advice do you give startup people that want to start up a, a company and how what advice do you give them with regard to what they need to have in place because it it you know just two years ago it was you could start virtually anything and you get funding that's no longer the case what what do you give as advice to organizations or people that are really looking to do a startup first of all i believe that during this time we build the best companies not we teammate i mean of course i i I hope that team it builds the best companies, but I mean, the high tech sector globally build, builds the, the best companies because now, as you said, it's not that you can raise money for everything. Now you really need to show that you have the technology skills, you have, you have the right mind to build product market fit, etc. So what is my advice? First of all, you need to build a fantastic team around you. And I know it, it's not just about, about startups. I couldn't do in the bank what I did without brilliant man, a, a brilliant management like I had. So first of all, you need the best people around you. you. If you are a tech person, you need a business person, you need marketing, you, you need all to build the right um, group that, that will be a team that is built for success. This is one. Second, if you are not determined and you are not optimistic and you are not courageous, so don't even start. Just don't even start because this is going to be tough. That's the way it is. And it's not only about building a startup. I can tell you that being the CEO of Lumi was tough. Yeah, yeah. It was difficult. Yeah. Because you know how it works. Every morning you get a phone call, What's, uh, what, what doesn't work? Because the thing that works, they don't need you. So yeah. from morning till night, you are dealing with challenges and huge challenges. That's the way it is. And yeah. in startups, you have to deal with these hardships sometimes by yourself. And this is part of the teammate model that we are there. The next room, you can get in my room and tell you if you have a problem. And we can think together, there is something about being part of this ecosystem that makes it a bit, a bit better, but yeah. it's still very hard. Thank you so much for being on the show. You know, you have a very interesting story, certainly an interesting background. We didn't even get into the entire startup and innovative marketplace of Israel because it's it's an amazing place to start companies and and it's right. really come into its own in a in a unique way. But it, you know, you, you it's it, it'll be interesting to see how this whole transformation in the industry goes. Because we're going through a, a challenging time for the fintech space, but you're actually at the cutting edge of helping to found and fund startups where, where people really are the major difference. They're the differentiator. Because you said it's very early, and we've learned on this podcast, it takes a leader. It takes a leader at a traditional bank or at a fintech startup or at, a, at be, being a, a leader in any company to be successful today. It, it's a completely different mindset. And it, you know, you, you mentioned it, it does take passion. So thank you again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take 30 to 45 seconds to show some love in the form of a review. It really helps us to continue to get such great guests. Finally, be sure to catch my articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Hathledge, audio engineer, Chris Fafalius, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. 
Until next time, remember, never underestimate women leaders driving change who emphasize the importance of authenticity, empathy, and envisioning a better future.